board. So we're going there. So welcome to Carol. Um, many of you know her extremely well already. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, working with her for the first time now uh, and uh, to hearing about uh, work with type and techies. So over to you, Carol. Thank you very much, Sharon. Glad to be here. We will get our show on the road. Is this up? And we should see type with techies. We see it. I'm so glad. I'm so glad to be here sharing this. I used to teach this about ten years ago through a, a company in the uh, midwestern part of the United States. I learned with blood, sweat, and tears how to work with a highly technical office uh, group of people. And it just occurred to me, guys, it's only grown in proportion to when I started uh, in the '90s and the early aughts working with technical teams. So my goal today is that you start off from a higher footing than I did and you get to take more experience in the training room with far less blood, sweat and tears on your part than I had. Uh, so here we go. It's a tough room guys. Let's face it, it's a skeptical audience. It's a tough room. I mean, it's this kind of tough room when you walk into it. And I don't want you walking into it unprepared. Now, I had experience before I walked into it. I worked at a software company, a global company for 26 years, 19 years I was in technical documentation. And that meant that on at least a weekly and many times a daily basis, I was working directly with tech support, R&D, testing. I was working with them because I was head of a large part of the documentation and they were reviewers of it and they gave me information. So I was in, regular contact with them just trying to get my job done. So frankly, it was a lot out of self-defense. I had to learn how to do this. And then I went into learning and development and I was responsible for purchasing 850 step two interpretive reports. A lovely thing happened. Let me tell you, this is practitioners. Someone higher up in the company than we were sent the executives off to a executive boot camp. And they came back and started talking Myers-Briggs. Well, my phone started ringing off the hook. What is this Myers-Briggs thing? My boss went to do it. And it, so, guys, I benefited beautifully. I just, I got cascaded all the way down from the executive level to frontline workers. It was, it was absolutely a wonderful boom that happened. I worked with teams. I did workshops with teams. I coached managers. I also did OD inventions with teams that were about to strangle each other. Now, that's a topic for another day, but just know, even though you don't hang your shingle up saying you'll walk into rooms full of people that strangle each other, if you do this kind of work, they may call on you. So I'm just warning you, be really clear if you're willing to do that or not. Um, so how are we going in the face of a skeptical group that's not really open? And let's face it, this is not really a people, people-oriented kind of group to start with. How are we going, to, we've got to work with their resistance and we want to make a difference. So how are we going to do that? First thing we're gonna do, let's look at who's in the room. Now I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but if you haven't got it, please go out to the website and get the pre-work because I gave you a two page summary of my years of data I collected on what the types are in the software community. And that informs what we're going to do, how we're going to work with the resistance, how we're going to flex to do things that will be more accessible to them, and uh, how we're going to pick which parts of our body of tools will have the most bang for the buck for them. So I'm going to discuss some actions I took that reduced resistance. I'm going to end with my favorite part, the biggest bang for the buck. I picked out three tools here, the biggest bang for the buck I got based on what the type spread is of the technical groups I work with. And I'm just prepping you for this. I'm gonna ask you at the end, if you'd share in chat or share openly, what have you heard that sounds useful that you're willing to try, something you're willing to try out when you work with a technical group. So here we go. First of all, I wanna know why you're here and Jerry's gonna launch a poll for me. And if you would check all that apply because it will be informative to me to know how many of these things appeal to you. Is the Poll launch, Jerry. There we go. I can see it. 
I'm not going to answer. So nine people have answered so far, 10. Okay. 11, one person still to go. Okay. Heads up, there wasn't an all, all you check all that applied. There was only one choice. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did not enter the, the poll. Uh, thank you for telling me that, Linda. I, I should have given Jerry instruction. I think there's a box to check if they can check more than one. Thank you. So let's see what we got. And what, Jerry, you're muted. Let's yeah. see what we got and, and I'll let people speak up with other things. Can we see the poll? Sorry, there we are. Yeah, should be there on there are? now. Okay. okay. Would anyone like to add something that they didn't get to check? Thank you, Linda, for warning me about that. You can just speak up if you want. Uh, yes. Hi, Carol. This is Carmel. Um, I I was drawn to your session because of the mention of how you the, what you did with step two. Ab, very good. There is a yeah. set. Uh, well, we will get there. Thank Great. you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Can I close? Thank you, guys. You did good to coach or teach. And by the way, the things that I'm teaching you. It's not just useful in a workshop, it's also useful when you're coaching them. So uh, I'm glad you're here. And uh, uh, I hope this is helpful to you in the, in the way it has been to me. So we're going to do, now we can do this with chat or you can speak up. This is an open book exam. I sent you, uh, I sent you pre-work that has all these answers on it. What we're doing here is I'm just review. You can use chat. You can speak up. We're just reviewing here the most five most important points about the technical, the typological makeup of the group in the room. So introversion. Uh, I don't. I don't have chat open. Let me see if I can open chat from here. You can use chat or you and Jerry. Here we go. I can get chat open. Um, Jerry, you can, you can speak whatever introversion up to what percent. At, any number what how much how much what do you think the preference of introversion was on these teams many of these teams oh y'all y'all are very good y'all are very good uh 87 percent is is a, a frontline team it was easily 87 percent it could, it gets a hundred sometimes, but uh, sometimes it's closer to, it doesn't get down to 50 until you get to tech support. In R&D teams, it's always 70, 80%. Well done. Even if you're looking at the cheat sheet, well done, guys. How about intuiting prefer preference? How does this show up differently than in the general population? There you go. It's 15, it's, it's uh, somewhere between, depending on whose day you look at, 22 to 30 percent in the general population. Guys, it's 40 percent and above. I'm not sure I ever found a group it was below 40 percent. It is hugely present in this, in this profession, in these groups. Thinking and feeling preference. This is probably a pretty easy one. Where do you think the, the balance was on thinking and feeling preference? Oh, Sandy, you're right. There is more S than in sensing than intuiting, but it's still a much larger percentage of intuiting than in the general population, like starting at 40%, but still below 50. Uh, thinking preference, absolutely. There is some feeling preference when I get to tech support. It's like 50% feeling thinking, but other otherwise, guys, it's just absolutely almost all uh, thinking preference. Now, judging functions. Um, I'm going to, I'm talking about eight function theory here, and there are four judging functions and eight fun, function theory. What do you think were the judging functions most, most prevalent I was dealing with in these rooms? Sandy, absolutely. The, the perceiving function, a lot of SI, TE, Linda, TE and TI, absolutely. Way more TE than find in other groups like banking industry and uh, the military, for example. A whole lot of introverted thinking here. Dean, you have a question. 
I did it, Carol. Um, I think I had a bias and I want to make sure I heard you right. Okay. You were saying that uh, for techies, there's a higher uh, N preference than S? No, not higher than S because there's so much more sensing in the population, but it's way higher than normal population. Instead of between 20 and 30 percent, it's 40 percent or above. Wow. And I would have the groups that tested either either uh, did the development for or tested uh, complex systems like the architecture folks, they could have 100% uh, intuiting preference. They'd be just mostly INTJs and INTPs. Okay, thank you. That's really yeah. helpful. Good, well done. Yeah, I just want y'all to be prepared for how these rooms are different. And the last one, there are four temperaments. Which two temperaments do you think are most present in these rooms? There you go, Jerry. There you go. Okay. Uh, there is um, there's a little uh, sensing, uh, perceiving the uh, improvisers, but they, you find them in the data center area, people dealing with hard, hardware. A few of them make it into the software development teams, but fewer. That group is less likely to have gone to a college education than other groups, not because they're not as smart, just because the educational system doesn't doesn't really play to their strengths. So you'll have a handful of ISTPs, for example, um, uh, not too many ESTPs, they end up in marketing, but some ISTPs, certainly you get chart the course uh, improvisers you will find in these groups. So yes, theorists and stabilizers are who you find mostly and more theorists than in the rest of the world. Okay, very good, I wanted you to have this in mind. By the way, I have spared y'all something. I used to start out and spend, of course, this was a longer class. I spent about a half an hour and I had all these data tables of these different kinds of groups. And one of the um, one of the attendees gave me feedback and it said, the presenter seems to be a bit enamored of her data. So I have spared you my being too enamored of my day. That said, if you want to have a talk with me and see all these tables, I'm very excited about that. But today I'm absolutely sparing you my overenthusiasm about data. So first we're going to look at how we reduce resistance. Uh, three ways, we're going to present a logical framework. We're going to avoid the put in a box feeling. Can I see, show of hands, how many of you have run into that resistance and, and completely, there you go. As the first time I was in a type workshop experiencing it, it was over the top, felt labeled and put in a box. It was way too warm and fuzzy. It just, um, and, and the person who started the workshop said, I am so not technical, I can't even program my VCR. And I'm thinking, one, I have no judgment about whether you can program your VCR, but please don't stand up in front of a technical group of people and tell them you're not technical and you can't program something. That's just not a good place to start. And I actually experienced that. Guys, you cannot make this stuff up. Seriously, real life is way funnier than anything you could make up. And make it real. The things we can bring to the table that help make it real to these people, that take it from theory and bring it, bring it into their real world. So first of all, reduce the kumbaya effect. Now I need to know if this is a cultural saying in my, if it's on the other side of the pond, Jerry, is kumbaya an expression on the other side of the pond? I think I know what you mean, but I've not heard it <laughs> as, a, as an effect like that. There you go. It's, uh, 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 yeah, it's just a song, with children in the States sing in camp, in summer camp, right? And it's, you know, real warm and fuzzy. And over here in the States, people who do the kinds of things we do for a living can be accused of being kumbaya, warm and fuzzy folks. So when you go into working with these groups, the last thing you want to come across as is a kumbaya, warm and fuzzy folks. Now, I have a handicap here. I'm a female Southern woman and I have ENFP preferences, and I am so warm and fuzzy, and I'm enthusiastic, and I am absolutely pathologically positive, positive and optimistic. So I have to reel that in some, because think about the distance between me and a skeptical IT group, okay? So I want you to know, I consciously reel that in. Um, Otto Kroger says, I'm not asking you not to be who you are, I'm just asking you to manage it better. So I just want you to know, I am very aware of what I need to manage better when I'm dealing with IT groups. So I do not, do not start off with anything warm and fuzzy. 
uh, example, I said there's, there's nothing warm and fuzzy about Dr. Carl Jung and his theory. He was a very analytical guy. He spent years developing his theory. I also say this is not about being nice. This is about being effective. I say, in fact, there's, there's nothing warm and fuzzy about this workshop. And once I got a heads up from the, the manager, and we call this the elephant in the room, he had a new employee come in. He said, Carol, can you get the, I know it's past the deadline. Can you get him into the workshop? I said, of course. I got back. I said, hey, I talked to him. He's on board. He's going to take it. And an hour later, I got a message back from the manager. He said, you know, Carol, after you spoke to him, he walked out in the hall, grabbed another one of my um, uh, developers and said, hey, is Mike really into all this warm and fuzzy? We'll say stuff. We'll say he said warm and fuzzy stuff. And so I knew that's what I was dealing with. So I said, there's nothing warm and fuzzy about this workshop. It's about being effective with people who are different from you. I said, in fact, if any of you try to hold hands and sing Kumbaya, I will stop you. And there was this dead silence. I was a risk, okay? And then they all lost it. And you could just see the body language shift in the room. They all relaxed. And at the end of this workshop, the next day, the manager sent me a message and an INT, one of his developers who validates INT, walked into his office and said, the workshop defied my expectations. It was not a complete waste of time. Now, guys, that may be the best compliment you get from a software developer who has ISTJ preferences. I'm just warning you when you go to work with this population. Last piece here. I am very careful when I am claiming something is data and when it's a hypothesis. Like if they ask me a question that I actually know the data from the research on, I'll share that. But if they ask me a question and I don't, I will say this. So, you know, I don't have the data on that, but based on type theory, my hypothesis is blah, blah, blah. Now that may sound small, but seriously, think about their world. Data and hypothesis, they are very different things. And I'm showing a respect for that. And that's telling them, at least subconsciously, she's not just, you know, blowing things out. There's real stuff here. And we can trust her if she says it's data, because if, if it's not, she says it's hypothesis. I don't know if they ever get that consciously, but I do think it gets, it gets in there. So are there any, we're about to move to, um, Avoid putting them in a box. Is there, before we move, any questions so far? Cindy. I have a real quick story. It might not be the right time for it. So you tell me, Carol. It's about a tech team I was on. Oh, can we do it after at the, sure. we're Absolutely. going to stick around afterwards. Thank you. Because I, I don't want to run short here, but hold on to that because we're going to call on you then. Okay, so uh, adjusting the exercise for him. I learned the very first workshop I did with them. I threw out a question to the room. This was a, a manager in a frontline development team, 87% introverted preference. I threw out a question, crickets, crickets. A answer went on, went on, threw out another question, crickets. So after an hour and a half, I took a break and then I noticed something. They were all around the room in little groups of threes and the room was humming what they're talking. They wanted to talk about it. They just weren't going to say it in the room. So right after the break, throw out a question, talk about that at your tables. I give you five minutes. The room buzzed. It buzzed for the rest of the day. Do not try big room questions. And then when I'd come back, would anyone like to share? I always had at least two or three of the tables be willing to share something that they talked about. So guys, it is painful to get crickets. So don't try the big room stuff. And then I'll tell you how I uh, how I altered what I usually do when I did, I, I used to teach it this way, I don't anymore, but I would do the classic introvert, extrovert exercises. And I'd have a group of extroverts and I'd have a group of introverts, right? Because this is an IT group. And then I would get, well, I'm both an introvert and an extrovert, I don't wanna choose. 
Now, I could have gone, humor me, just, you know, pick the one that you think best is, but I got it. I looked at their faces and I thought, if I make them do anything, I will have lost them. So I never, I always accommodated. And I said, great. And I did another chart. And the other chart, well, I, I created three groups. And it was introverts, extroverts, and the don't make me choose. And the interesting thing is when you debrief the answers, that mixed group chart comes out a mixed set of answers. It like proves type theory in the room that the people who said, I do both. Now, we all know we all extrovert functions and we introvert functions. We just tend to have a preference and live more in one world than the other. Some of us more obviously, some of us more slight preferences. But guys, not making them go in a group that they don't want to go in, I, don't go there or do whatever you can to flex and create something that they can really, that they can sign up for. Now, I also, I only did this once. I'm interested in any of you did this because I'd never seen this before, but I'm working with this large group and, and they're really cooperating well. And this is at the end of the workshop and I've given them the step two report. And the manager held up his hand and said, Carol, the last time we did this, the facilitator let us line up in the, around the room based on our scores for extrovert and introverted. And I know Dean is shaking your head and I'm not one, I'm wondering if this is such a good idea, but I looked at his face and he, his face was lit up and he was interested and the people around him were all looking at me for an, and I thought, sure, let's do that. I had no idea how useful this would be, but we do it. So I said, okay, for introvert, very clear over here, down to slight and to zero and uh, extrovert up to very clear. And so they started lining up around the room. And you can imagine this is what that room looked like. Now, it took the last person a while to get to her place in the room. And it was there. She had scored a very clear five on extroversion. And at this point, I took a risk and I turned to her and I said, I said, Julie, do you ever feel lonely? And luckily it did not hurt her feelings. She cracked up, the whole room died laughing and she laughed and then she started into, you know, sometimes I'd really like to go down the hall and find somebody to talk about this with. So I'll have to give it to Daryl. It actually was useful and insightful for that group to do that. So I'm glad. I didn't know it was gonna turn out well, but you see what they've got energy around and do your best to go there for them. That's what I've learned. And the last one here, I, I do it with temperament or essential motivators. I actually teach it as essential motivators and use that language. And I put up, you know, we have four charts around the room. I describe them, we discuss things, and then they go and I, we do an exercise. I give them a set of questions to answer. And for the first time ever, and this happened regularly in IT groups, I did this all the time. Someone's, uh, well, excuse me, someone said, I can't, I had them go and there were six, there were six people left, guys, I think all guys. And, and I said, guys, and they said, we're both stabilizer and theorists who can't choose. I'm really both of them. So I did it. I got a piece of the stick up flip chart paper and I wrote stabilizer theorist and I created a group for them. And here is the beauty of that. I would debrief and I'll show you the exercise later. Improviser, stabilizer, theorist, cows. And then I would go back to stabilize their theorists. They'd stand by their chart. And we'd, I would put, I'd put the class, the class would be in learning mode. I said, okay, now we're gonna go over each of these words. I want you to say, is that more a stabilizer? Look, sound like stabilizer influence or theorist? Guys, it happened every time. That table, that paper had about 50% stabilizer concerns and 50% theorist. It was type theory, coming alive in the room for them. Whereas the stabilizer and theorist sheets were, were pretty much stabilizer theorist. That one was a mix. And it's like showing them this is li living and breathing in people we know in this room. So again, I got rewarded every time I flexed to do something for them. Jerry, is there, I see there are comments coming along, but I, I can't look at all of it. Is there anything in the comment we need to pull up now? Just a lot oh, of Cindy, just a lot yes, of Cindy. just a lot of warmth, Carol, and uh, okay. agreement. <laughs> okay, we're good. just coming up. We are just coming up to we're now two minutes to three. So for those who were here at the start, I'm just going to 
just going to okay. alert in a moment we need to stop for that moment's silence absolutely thank you i will actually let's um it's two minutes till let's do this one thing now this i use linda Barron's model of self and guys i will tell you this is my absolutely favorite piece for helping them not feel put in a box this is so important Tell them the instrument is measuring wiring from their core self of what their core preferences are. We come with those, but that is nowhere near all that we are. We have a developed self. We adapt and grow. I ask them at their tables, discuss what goes into creating your developed self. They always come up with uh, good answers to that. And then I talk about the contextual self and I say in different situations, you behave differently. Now, now I'm setting them up for flexing. And I say, like at a wedding and a funeral, you behave differently because you're a well-adapted adult. So you can behave differently and yet you're still being yourself. I'm setting us up for, but you're asking me not to be myself by flexing. Jerry, are we it's there? It's one minute two now. Yeah, one minute two, let's, one minute three. Let's do it. Okay, I'm gonna end this one. So for those who joined late, it's worth explaining, just in case you're not particularly aware, that it's in the UK, it's Prince Philip's funeral today. And so there is uh, in the UK a minute's silence at three, uh, which Carol has kindly um, put a couple of slides in. And I was just suggesting to her earlier that we've all lost people this, this year uh, that we've been aware of. Uh, so however we might feel about the British royal family, there's an opportunity here just to uh, remember for a moment. So the minute starts now. Thank you. Yes, that was lovely. That need to happen. I'm glad I'm glad you asked for that. And while I'm I'm, I'm going back to where we were. Does anybody uh, uh, have any questions they want to ask, clarifying questions they want to ask now? Two, it's, it's not, uh, you are screen sharing, but it's not. There we go. You seeing it? Okay, very good. Now, I do not know, excuse me, I do not know why I lost, excuse me, I lost the, uh, the preview screen when I did that this time. I had it before. Okay, we were talking about, uh, we had gone up through situational behavior and what I'm preparing them for there, what I'm preparing them for there is flexing. Later on, you're not, I'm not asking you not to be you. I'm As Otto Kroger would say, I'm not asking you not to be you, I'm just asking you to manage it better. And we all have things about ourselves we can manage better that will, help make us more effective with groups of people. So I just stress your complex things, no one can put you a label or put you in a box. You are way too complex for that. And guys, when I, when I started learn, using this model, it just works wonders. I mean, you can just see as you do some of these things, how it reduces resistance in the room. Uh, it just, it's just is worth every minute of doing that. Now, now we're moving on to make it real. Do we have any uh, questions about uh, not putting them in a box? I like to develop self as big. Oh, thanks, Lindy. Yes, I think I got that from you. Frankly, I might have made it a little bigger. Um, this is 
these two things that make it real, these very short and sweet, but guys, they really matter. I actually, now th remember, remember way back when, when we actually showed up in a room with human beings and we did these things, right? So I would be there and I would have the manual there and I would have tabs. I would say chapters eight and nine are about the uh, years of validity and statistics of, on reliability and validity of the MBTI instrument. And it's up here if anybody wants to take a look at it at the break. And I'll put it on my table where I was teaching. Now, some of these people had PhDs in statistics, okay? None of them came up and looked at it. But guys, I think it mattered that I brought into the room, there's real stat work on this. It is really here. So that's just a small thing, but I think it helped. Now, the next thing I did was page two of the interpretive report. Now, you do this at the end. And by the way, you can teach this with or without the instrument. When I worked in corporate America and they had money for it, I used the step two instrument. I, when I worked for a community college, I didn't. You can still teach this without the instrument. But I will tell you when you have the instrument, what helps technical groups. This is my last page of the instrument. Now, I will tell you when I first started, started using this years ago, I'm not sure if the instructions are still the same, but the instructions are clear. Take the last page of the report off and do not show it to your clients. Now, you know what? That's probably fine for a civilian population. But when you're dealing with a room full of people, computer software engineers and statisticians, this is meaningful. Oh, I'm, I'm pointing. I'll try to still look at you, but I'm pointing over here at the step two report. See, uh, uh, under the facet scores, the bars on the graph show average range scores for ENFPs in the national sample, because that's my preference. So I'm telling them that the blue bar represents scores that are plus one, plus minus one standard deviation from the mean, and that the vertical line in each bar, the little blue is the mean, and that the black number is where their score lands. Guys, there is silence in the room and they are all studying this piece of paper. Standard deviation, how can we now poo poo something that has standard deviation and plus plus minus one of the mean and it shows where other people land and where they land. Jerry, you give it to them, yes. I, I, uh, I, I was disobeying instructions when I did it, but guys, this is big payoff. This to them says there's something to this thing. Um, and uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but, and Jerry, you give it out too. Yes, I found with technical groups, it's meaningful. Now I'm not sure, there may be some groups this will be more puzzling than meaningful too, but I frankly did give it out to technical groups and it works. Carmel, you do it too, very good. Okay, now then. We are going to go, you know about Dario, Nair, Dario Nardi's EEG and type research. Okay, so I'm going to have to stop sharing, come out of this to show this to you. Now, I'm not advising you to break copyright with Dario Nardi and start using his stuff without his permission. I went, I don't wanna be modeling bad things here. I went through his certification program and I got his permission to show a few slides. And the reason I need to get out of this and the reason I did, this goes back to, now we've still got Prince Philip up. This goes back to making it real. And I will share screen. Okay. And you can see it? Okay, nodding, good, I'm seeing nodding. All right. The whole point of this, and I don't spend a lot of time on it, but the whole point of this is, here is someone in a college environment who has got measurement, measurement tools, EEG, and is doing research to showing that he can measure something based on people's type preferences and what they're doing. So I show just a few of the slides, like I show, I show here's the research team, I say the guy, okay, don't tell Dario I said this. This was years ago. I say the guy in the, I say, you see the guy in the middle in the green, the t-shirt who looks 14, he's the college professor. They all love that. Okay, don't tell Dario I said that. And they they see that this is, um, hold on, let me get to the cap. So here's the research team. They're, they're putting on the cap and, oh, excuse me, I lost the screen where we're showing. Oh, here's what the researcher sees. 
Here's what the researcher sees. They're asking people for about two hours of different activities and they're seeing what parts of the brain light up and what patterns occur. And then I go to this one slide to make it real. Small example, person with an extroverted preference, look at the top one, looking at a blank screen. They've been told we're about to show you something. So they're sitting there waiting to focus their energy on the screen. And the one below it, that's how their brain typically lights up when they see something. Now, let's look at what happens with someone with a validated introverted preference. Now, the theory is, what's got, see how the brain is lit up before then? Well, they're inside doing their internal thing. They're not waiting on somebody to show them something. They're doing their internal thing. Look how lit up the brain gets when they're shown because they've already got a bunch of internal activity going on. This is what causes overwhelm when someone with a clear introverted preference is forced to be in a room with other people all day doing meeting work. It's not that they don't like working with people, but this shows you their brain is using much more energy when they're in that situation and they go back to their office to plug in and re-energize because that is more overwhelming. Now, there's a lot more to be said here. I don't go to any more than that. But guys, I, I, you know, I'm showing this up on a big screen. Remember, I'm in the room and I turn around and I look at their faces and they are riveted. This is technology. This is a computer screen. This is graphs. This is little things on people's head. All of this helps make this real. I just take like five minutes to do this, but it's worth uh, every minute. One hand, thanks for, I don't, I still don't understand to communicate this. Thanks for the learning curve. Well, Dean, we'll talk about that later. I don't understand what that question is. We'll talk about that later. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm going to be getting back up the slide deck. Does anybody have any questions uh, uh, while I'm going back? No questions? We good? What did, what did, what did y'all think about the, the Dario Nardi piece? Was that, that look useful, interesting, off topic? What? Useful? Now, I'm saying that. There you go. Okay. So this is my favorite part. Well, the other things are necessary. Okay, I'm glad I said, but this is my really favorite part. And this is biggest bang for the bunk teaching points. We're going to start with a piece of eight function. Now, you don't need to teach eight function to make this work, but we're going to start with a big piece of uh, eight function theory, extroverted, introverted thinking. We're going to do a piece on temperaments, and then we're going to go to early starting and pressure prompted. And I'm going to have to do a trick here. They learned how to get the gallery back when I'm doing slide share, but you have to stop slide share and go back in it to get your gallery back. So FYI, I learned I learned something that was very useful. And and I lost the gallery again, but so much for for my my um. There you are. You're just behind it. I just need to move you in front. That is fabulous. Just have to click on you. Okay, so how I learned how I learned about extroverted thinking and introverted thinking came up in a workshop. It was Chris and John. Chris liked his manager and got along well with him, but he um he was leaving his meetings with him very puzzled. And John liked Chris too, but John was leaving his meetings like this. What keeps going wrong with these conversations? And how this got surfaced is. I'm in a classroom with John and Chris, and I'm teaching introverted and extroverted thinking. Now, I'm not using this language for them because I'm not teaching all light like function theory at this point. I'm pulling out things that are useful to them. I'm using English words. So I'm teaching them about analyzing to understand and analyzing to organize and execute. And I teach them as different languages. Here, Analyzing to organize 
analyze and execute is using logic in the external world. You're talking about, you're organizing things. You're talking about doing what by when, you're developing schedules, deliver, deliverables, deadlines. You're, one of the application, this is of course, classic project management. And it sounds like this, what the deadline is, when can you get this done? This is the schedule, this is how we proceed. It's a certain kinds of nouns because you're talking about certain things. But then there's another way to use analytical reasoning. And of course, we all use, we all are capable of using all of them, we just have a preference. And this is analyzing to understand and it's building models in your head. Carol, I so, don't know whether you, uh, Carol, just to interrupt, I'm not sure whether you think you're sharing slides at the moment or not, but we're not seeing it. Oh, yes, I do, because it's showing them to me. Uh, how far did, uh, so, I mean, thank you, just, just where last, did it end? Up, just the last couple of minutes, since you since you went off and came came back again. Just need to click on the green button at the bottom, share screen. Oh, mine's Maybe. a blue button, thank you. Okay. okay. So it is sharing now, right? Yeah. Yes. And did y'all see did y'all see the screen? No, no, that was where that was the, I think that was where it's where we lost connection on that. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, John and Chris, the manager and the programmer, they were having a thank you so much for, for telling me, Jerry. They were just struggling with each other. And the great thing is these two guys actually liked each other. Okay, but it just wasn't working. And so I'm explaining introverted thinking and extroverted thinking, although I'm using I'm using words instead of the, uh, instead of our little T I T E. And this is what extroverted thinking sounds like and is talking about. It's scheduling things. I'm going through quickly because you've heard the you've heard this. And this is what um, analyzing to understand is like you're building models in your head and a piece of data comes in does it fit the model no okay well is the data off base or wrong throw it away wait a minute does the model need to be to be uh modified so that's going on all the time again we can all do it some of us just prefer to do it and it sounds like this is why but what if and what's really going on here so comparing these two you're organizing, coordinating, sequencing, looking criteria. You're doing different kinds of things. You're trying to organize to make this happen when you're organizing to execute, analyzing to execute. On the other hand, you're identifying principles and categorizing, classifying. You're getting a clear understanding. And those are two different goals. And those are two different languages. And these are two totally different conversations. And at this point, Chris and John look at each other and burst out laughing. And, you know, I'm funny sometimes to, to help the, but I, I was being deadly earnest. I said, I got curious, you know, we, got we get taught in coaching to get curious. I said, John, what's so funny? And they're looking at each other and he said, Carol, Chris and I here have been having that exact conversation for about six years now. And then the whole room died laughing because they had all been witnessing Chris and John have this conversation for six years. Uh, one, you know, John was saying, when can you, and Chris was saying, but what if, and they were just having this experience. John had INTJ preferences, Chris had ENTP preferences. So Chris lived here and John lived here. Now, I'm, gosh, you're never supposed to say you're embarrassed, but this is a little embarrassing. The, the, the answer to this question is so simple. It's a little embarrassing, okay? so. I made up a big secret slide to precede a very simple suggestion. This is the way I found to help them through it. You have to stop talking execution and start and start talking issues. Those two conversations cannot happen at the same time. You end up like John and Chris, it does not work. Start talking execute, stop talking execution and start talking issues. Well, about three months later, I called John. I always called managers a few months after the workshop. How are things going? And at one point, he said, you know, Carol, Chris and I still have that problem every now and then. And whichever one of us realizes says, hey, we're doing that thing again. He said, and then we both laugh. And then we go on. So they don't remember anything I taught them about what's going on or why it happens. But you know what? It doesn't matter. 
because they just call it that thing we get into and then they make it work. So I really, I can't tell you how many times I've had it affirmed in technical groups that this introverted thinking, extroverted thinking piece really, really gets in their way. Now there are two more points. How am I doing on time here? Uh, Jerry, I, we've just got two more things to talk about. Yeah, we've got uh, 12 minutes till half past, but then uh, if you're happy to stay longer for discussion, which I think you are, then we've got plenty of time. Oh, we're good. I'll get through it by half past, and then I'm willing to hang around and talk because, you know, oh, Briar Frock, please don't make me hang around and talk Myers Briggs with our type of a bunch of people I love to talk with. Okay, so let's look at uh, two more things to talk about. Let's look at why I use temperaments. What's important, what I get from temperaments is it's important to recognize and honor what's important to, com so to communicate effectively with other people and to build trust. And we can get at this essence through uh, temperament theory or central motivators. I personally use essential motivators. Now, we're not going to go into this type theory. Oh, actually, can I see uh, a show of hands? How many people are familiar with type theory? I'm not going to, you don't, it doesn't matter if you're not right now. Most, most everybody is, okay. So, I, and, I, and I tell them type theory goes back goes back to the Greeks, but we're not going to talk about what it's done through the centuries, but I'm very grateful to David Kearsey, his book, Please Understand Me Too, introduced me to temperament and to type, and I studied with Linda Behrens and Eve DeLunas, and of course these two women are, are, are speakers at this conference, keynote speakers, and Eve did 30 years of research with him. Now, the reason I'm listing both Linda and David is I don't use David's terminology, just personal preference. I find that Linda's um, terminology works better in a corporate environment. So I use these four words for temperament instead of Kiersey's traditional words. Not passing any judgment, use what you're comfortable with, but I have really found this works. These words resonate in a corporate environment. Just the brief overview, why we have difficulties in a room is if you look at the different core drivers and that each temperament is going after something so different. That's how we end up with people not understanding each other. Now, before I get to the next piece of this, I would like to say something I've witnessed in a room after the uh, stabilizer improviser presentation, then I do a break and we do the other two. I saw a theorist developer walk across the room and stop at the desk of a woman on his team and say, she, she had improviser preferences. And he said, I feel like I understand you for the first time in three years. Guys, you just can't buy that kind of stuff, but the value in this understanding can take people to that place. Now, the main two things I do with this with them is uh, there's a lot of stabilizers and theorists, and we all know how the stabilizers and theorists can miss the mark with each other. So the tactic I use is help reframe it, learn reframing and coaching reframe the stabilizer and the theorist to each other. I actually do it for all four. We're focusing here now. What is the good the other person's trying to accomplish? Because when you get into being annoyed with them, you're just convinced they got up that morning to make your day hard, to get in your way, right? We can all, we can all get in that not so, not so, shall we say, generous place. So, and, and they get there. So I try to reframe. The stabilizer, it wants to stabilize the system. Person who, who, inhabits that pattern. They want to keep stop bad things from happening. They want the lights to be on. They want things to work. They want to glean wisdom from the past. They are trying to help us succeed by helping us learn from the past and not make things unstable. The theorist is also trying to do a good thing. Now, from the stabilizer's perspective, they can be blowing things up and setting people's hair on fire and not caring. So one of the things I try to help theorist preference do is respect the, to see from the stabilizer's eyes how when sometimes they're doing things that look risky and look like they're going to destabilize things. And it can be so easy from one perspective to just blow the other perspective and their concerns off. I, 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 every time I hear someone with intuitive preference say to a stabilizer, oh, oh, those are just details. We'll handle that later. You might as well set their hair on fire. Never say that details they don't matter now it may be true that 
that's not the right time for the details. But what I do in the meeting is that that sounds great. That sounds like something important we don't want to lose. And I get someone to write, here I am pointing to a flip chart on my wall, right? I get someone to write it on the flip chart. And then if, and, and whose name needs to be put here? Who needs to make sure this doesn't fall through the cracks? Once you've captured the data and shown the stabilizer, you respect data, you respect keeping things safe, and you're not going to let this fall through cracks. Now they can move on and not go into the details, but please don't tell them to throw them away. So I just work at helping each, respecting where the others come from, helping the stabilizer manager typically not look at the young theorist as being disrespectful. And I have to help the young theorist see how what he's doing sometimes looks risky and careless and disrespectful. So if we can help them not blow off each other's concerns, this can really help this team because this is who's mainly on the team. And I'm seeing some, I'm seeing some nodding hands. Cindy's nodding at me. Is this uh, cat? Okay, there we go. So here we go. Uh, and I, I just, this was the story about the the theorist walking over and telling the uh, person with the improviser preferences, I feel like I understand you. And, and think about that. If somebody seems mysterious to you for three years and your core is competency, that can really rock your trust. And, and you're not quite sure it's okay to work with that person because you're not sure where they're coming more from. Now we can get to building some trust because they understand where they're coming from. And uh, next to last piece, I do this temperament exercise. We're not going to go through this now. Y'all know this exercise, but I do. I ask them to be at their temperament charts. And yes, I have a stabilizer theorist chart, and it's about trust. Question about communication. So they're informing their other colleagues how to. This is in your handout, by the way. How to, what trust looks like to me, and how you can communicate effectively with me. Number three, I ask them to get. Whoops, I asked him to get reflective. In what ways, and I, what I, how I say this is now, sometimes, maybe sometimes, you might be a little difficult for on other people. And that makes them all laugh. And by the way, guys, they are nail on the head. They all know how they can make things hard on other people. I don't ask them to tell each other because that gets in, can get into a, a blame game. And I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole. But they are really conscious of it. And the fourth one is to get to help them approach flexing. Now that we know what are a couple of things we could shift and flex in order to not be hard on other people. I, I'm going to go to, oh, I had a theorist group 60 seconds into the exercise and Daryl said, Carol, we're finished. And I turned around and this is what the theorist flip chart said. And I said, Daryl, do you think you could work a few more details into that for me? And he laughed and he said they would try. But, but that's, that's what a, a, a flip chart of theorists will do for you. The last piece, how am I going on time now, Jerry? Because I, I can't see the uh, clock. Five, yeah, 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 five minutes, five minutes. Oh, we're cool, guys. Perfect. Now, this is what they see, uh, hmm, when to start, but you're type people, so I'm gonna tell you what we're looking at here. We're looking at early starting the pressure prompt tool. Now, I do wanna tell you, you don't have to use the step two instrument to do this. This is a facet on step two, but you don't have to use it. Adults get this. You explain this and adults get this. They've experienced it in themselves with other people, home and family. Adults all get this. and. We used to, for example, when I was originally taught this, there would be, excuse me, wrong error. There'd be a, a J over here by early starting and a P by pressure prompted. One of the blessings, uh, and I was taught that originally, one of the blessings of the step two data is it shows us that up to 40% of people with a perceiving preference have an early starting preference, not pressure prompted. So you can't teach pressure prompted as P, well, we know P and J aren't things, real things anyway, but you can't teach pressure prompted as P if we now know 40% of them don't. For example, and I, I show people where I tell them it's a scale, it's not all one or the other. This is where I happen to fall. I'm an early starting ENFP. That's my one out of, out of preference, preference. Now that's it, I explain, I explain to them that 
oh, excuse me, that this is about wiring. This is about energy. This is not about someone trying to annoy you. If you are pressure prompted, it really is wiring. You don't get the energy to summon, to get the mental, mental processes going to actually do it. If you're early starting, like I am, I have a quality value. It makes me anxious. We're not going to get it done well enough. Then we got to leave time for things to go wrong. Because I was in the software energy guy, industry, guys. Things always went wrong in the software industry. So I get made nervous by that. And I explained to pressure prompted folks, your energy works like this. You get a jolt of energy when you're right about to have something due. And then your, your energy goes down. And you need that in order to get something done. This is wiring. This is not you trying to annoy people. That said, here's the deal. When you're by yourself, it's fine to be as pressure prompted as you want to be. But when you're working in a team situation, you need to know about early starting preference and you need to know this is scaring people and this is creating mistrust and that is not helpful for teamwork. So when you're working with others, you've got to rein in the pressure prompted in the way I recommend it be done that works for everybody. The magic solution is milestones. When you create milestones, it's classic project management, right? When you create milestones, you give pressure prompted folks on the team the opportunity to raise their energy and get that done. Don't give them a six month deadline, give them milestones along the way. They're gonna have no energy to work toward that six month. Um, oh, I'm an, I'm an early starter. Oh, yeah. oh, Linda, oh, Linda, that would scare me to death. But I so admire you, Linda, that you can do that. I really do, but I can't. I've been working on these slides for two weeks. So I'd like to ask you, uh, uh, is there something you can do it in chat? You can open up and say, I'm hoping there's something useful that you saw today that you uh, think would be good to apply when you work with technical clients, coaching or teaching. Carol, I just wanted to compliment you on <clears throat> your specificity with those three things that you picked out for technical clients. I think uh, uh, that, that was just so clear and so great, especially the language for TE and TI and how you put that together for them. It, 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 I just love the way you pick those three things. You, you, so specific to your audience. Awesome. And my goal here was to be useful. And by the way, we have to give Linda Barron's credit for teaching me TINT. <laughs> Anybody else something that, um, thank you, Claire. Very good. Okay, I do, I do want to end. Um, guys, they call it herding cats for a reason. So when you're dealing with uh, technical audiences, my hope for you is at least four out of your five cats are engaged with you, but you may never get that fifth cat, but this is my hope for you moving forward. Carol, that's fantastic. Thank you. What a lovely picture to find to conclude the uh, the presentation. I'm, I'm going to just stop uh, recording here with many, many thanks to you, but